Welcome to Herbally Yours, an adventure into the world of natural medicine. Here is your host, Dr. Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse who will help you take the leap to ultimate wellness. Greetings, and thank you so much for joining me, Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse, for another edition of Herbally Yours, right here on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC, Garden City, New York. And hopefully this is being recorded. We have our illustrious engineer here, so I imagine he's pressed the record button. And I want to tell you that Herbally Yours brings you the latest information about the many facets in the world of natural living. Today, my guest is Krista Anderson. Krista is the founder and CEO of Astar, an international organic food brokerage and distribution company with offices internationally in the United States and France. Astar makes healthy snack food accessible through their healthy on-the-go food stations in retail stores across the country. She was called to action by a long but thank God victorious battle with stage two cancer and stage four cancer when she was given three months to live. Krista then became passionate about healthy eating. Her mission is to help create a preventative healthcare system by making healthy food accessible to the public, both to help fight disease and to encourage and maintain a healthy lifestyle. And to find Krista, we'll have links right on our website on the show archive. But those of you who are listening live today, you can go to contact at Krista, that's K-R-I-S-T-A, Anderson, dot C-O. Thank you so much for joining us today, Krista. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here, Ellen. Thank you. Now, there's so many topics we can, uh, we can really cover, but let's first go back in terms of your personal history. Um, what was life like before your diagnosis? And then what was the wake-up call moment for you? Hmm, that's a great question. Uh, life before, I mean, it was, uh, I've always had a kind of a healthy lifestyle. Uh, I always ate pretty healthy. I grew up, uh, my mom always made um, fresh foods from the garden. We, I was raised with the garden. We never really ate a lot of um, bad foods, so to speak, but um, lived a very healthy lifestyle. And um, I think the real wake up call obviously was, as you'd mentioned, uh, my cancer journey. So that was kind of a shock to me after living years of a healthy life. And you're like, okay, how can something like this happen? And so um, that would be for sure the wake up call that came into my life a couple of times, as you'd mentioned. Yes. And so is there anything that you, after being into health, could link to a causative factor? Of, of Is it genetic? Do you know if other people in mm. your in your um, family had this kind of incident? Were you living in a place where there was toxins in the water? Um, you know, usually there's an initiating incident, but we don't always know what it is. Sometimes it's psychological, <laughs> a lot of press, pressure about that as well. Yeah, you know, it's a question I've had since the beginning, and I do, still do not have the answer. I have assumptions or things like that, but Honestly, I pray all the time to be shown the answer to this, to find the solution for people because it's taking over more and more and a lot more people are being diagnosed with cancer and I feel like, feel very lifeless often in that. But for me, I've been told that it, it was more of a genetic situation of the kidney. Um, I personally believe, you know, the Monsanto, the, the chemicals, the things that are put in our food are a huge factor. Um, things like that, of course, go out through the air. Um, we've got a lot of things penetrating us every single day, and it's a lot for our body to handle. Um, of course, genetically, these things can cause um, you know reactions in the body that get passed down from generation to generation. So we don't really know where it's coming from. When I spoke to my on on oncologist about it, he uh, he said, "No, it doesn't have anything to do with the food." You know, while you know at the hospitals they feed people full of you know, junk food also. Oh my so. God, that's <laughs> such a big point, Krista. In yeah. almost every hospital, and I don't know about whatever country you might be in, but in, in the US, in every hospital, 
there's a sort of a food court area. And a lot of them are owned by big junk food corporations like Subway or McDonald's or any other of the, you know, fast food items. Right. They have contracts in there and it makes absolute no sense to me. Uh, that's why a big part of my focus with my company is we put organic foods into hospitals right now. It's a big part of our mission uh, because of that reason. There's a desperate need for it. It should be the number one place we can find uh, healthy foods to help. One would disease. think. One would think. Right. And wow. I'll tell you, if you do get involved, let's say, with the HR and, and different internal staff in hospitals, I'll tell you a good way to look for this. If you contact the American Holistic Nurses Association, mm -hmm. of which I am a very active member, and we have chapters all over the country. So I also was a professor at Stony Brook University, um, where I actually taught interns and other people involved with learning at, at that university about holistic living and techniques. It had to be science-based. So as you know, there is so much science backing up what you are doing with a star with offering healthy food. And there were always large numbers of people who actually work at these places. We started at Stony Brook University a rooftop garden. Mm, that's amazing. Off of one, yes, off of one of the floors, they actually got funding to bring in dirt and make raised beds with organic soil. So at first, you know, they were made fun of it and everything until the first year where they had a bumper crop. And then they worked out a program where the food went right into the kitchen, the hospital kitchen. And that still was not recognized so much except by the, the, um, the patients who said, oh, my God, this is fantastic. We have fresh broccoli. It's delicious. And but then they did a cost analysis and found that the entire food service had saved, you know, like thousands of dollars. And then they became a lot more interested in the project. Mm, that's incredible. That's a great, uh, a great uh, test for other hospitals. to see. Absolutely. I mean, it should just be the norm. It should exactly. just be, why isn't everybody, every block, wherever you live, growing your own food? It's such a simple thing. Even if not everybody on the block wants to, um, you know, one person usually does, and you can make it an outside upfront garden and even have a box where people can chip in to take some stuff if you want. I mean, it's like an easy thing to have everybody fed instead of this ridiculous chemical uh, food conglomerate. Exactly. I think it's more uh, education. I think a lot of people, you know, it's just a matter of education, teaching people how to do this, that it is easy, you know, it probably seems overwhelming with, you know, from my perspective, one of the, the reasons that I live in France is the, the American culture, it's the penetration of busyness is so heavy that you feel like you have no break, you know, to do something like that. And so I think it's, it's definitely from an educational standpoint, for sure. So in your project, it sounds like something that really is very based on making healthy food more accessible to the average person. Yes, we vet. So we don't manufacture anything yet. Uh, but what we do do is we search for America's top brands of we're on the snack side. So we don't do fresh food, although I would love to be in that space. But we focus more on snacking um, on the go because that's a big thing in the U.S. And uh, the brand partners that we have, they go through a rigorous process to prove that their manufacturing processes are transparent, that the uh, ingredients they use are truly healthy. They've got the certifications to back it up, um, that the product that people are putting in their bodies are truly healthy. So we're kind of that extra verification that's much stronger than an organic certification or anything else because I want to put product out and make product accessible that is truly healthy that if I had cancer again I would put that in my body. So I want to remind your listeners that you are listening to Herbally Yours with your host, myself, Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse, right here on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. And today, our guest is Krista Anderson. Uh, 
and you can find her at, well, you can email her at contact at kristaanderson.co. And she also has an Instagram and Facebook at kristaanderson.co. Is the .co because it's in Canada? No, it's .co, like company. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Good question, though. It doesn't matter because it's all in the who knows where, right? Exactly. Well, and you know, nowadays everything is taken, so you've got to get creative. <laughs> now, did you, are you living in France at this time? I do live in France. I'm sitting in Nashville, Tennessee at the moment, but I will be back in France this week. Well, be careful because the COVID is uh, very high in Tennessee as well, as in Florida, where I am. It's um, really uh, exacerbating, yeah. which is unfortunate. But eating healthy on the go is definitely a struggle because I travel so much, you know, lecturing all over the country, you know, more or less I, until COVID, I was actually on a plane, I would say every week, I would be flying somewhere. And what I did, my, my um, modem up random was to take food with me every single where I go. And even now, if I go out for the day in a car, I have a little cooler in the car, I bring my own food, specifically because it is so hard to find like a snack food on the run that is healthy enough for me to choose to eat. Exactly. And that's exactly what really inspired me to start this company was that packing food every time I left the house because I couldn't trust anything on the go. I didn't want to starve, you know, and I saw the opportunity, but I'm curious, Ellen, what do you pack? What's in okay, that? Okay. So in what, that what, uh, yeah, <laughs> what I, I really, you know, make it really simple because I'm not a cook. I eat everything either raw or lightly steamed. So I will make a bunch of steamed vegetables and even cooked meat, let's say, lamb or something, free range lamb. I'll make little teeny weeny burgers out of them and then freeze them. And I might take one of those just frozen because by the middle of the day, it'll be defrosted. And then I will have steamed vegetables, which will usually look like a rainbow. It'll have carrots, celery, red cabbage, beets, um, maybe some zucchini, pre-steamed, and I also always throw in cranberries, actually, at the very end of the steaming session. And a steaming session is about, you know, five minutes total because I don't put time into cooking. So then once that's cold, I actually scoop it into a glass dish with a tight cover that you can get anywhere, you know, Target, whatever. And then I take that dish, throw scoops of vegetables in it, and one of those little pellets of, let's say, a lamb burger. And then I leave those in the refrigerator and it's grab and go. So, you know, I'll have like four or five of those lined up when I make them fresh. Some might be frozen and then I'll take them in the freezer. It's just grab and go. And then I might take a full carrot and a celery stick and always rice cakes. I really like organic brown rice cakes as a snack for me. I don't need any wheat you know, no sandwiches or anything like that. So I find that's fine because by the middle of the day, that thing that's in the container is warm enough to eat here in Florida. And when I'm traveling more extensively, I've actually walked in to stores like 7-Eleven where there's nothing there that I can choose to buy unless you have one of your stands there. And I will go and use their microwave. Whoops. <laughs> I actually just woke up, put my thing in the microwave, warm it up for, you know, like half a minute just to take the chill off. And so that's what I do on the road. Oh, that's great. I love that. That's great for other people to hear because, you know, it, it's challenging. But it's easy. It sounds very simple. You can prepare all that in advance. It's very simple. And, and it requires, I put in, I do carve out time for that. Like you said, Americans are very busy. I carve out two hours a week, a week, not a day, a week to make sure I have the food ready to grab and go. And also when I was raising my children who are now 46 and 42, so it's a while ago, but since I was always a working mother and raised them on my own, they were definitely latchkey kids. So when they came in, those were the foods that were available to them for snacks. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And it was prepared beforehand. So it's it's basically what, it, if you can make it easy, and I think that's what you're trying to do, make it easier to grab a healthy snack. Exactly. Yeah. And that when I first started the company, we started in gas stations because I thought, what is the quickest way to give people access? And we have gas stations on every corner, you know, almost. So 
that was the route that I went, which was not easy in the beginning because people don't think healthy food at a gas station, right? So uh, we we had to really fight that battle uphill for many years, but now it's becoming more and more common. So, is what is becoming more and more common? Seeing healthier foods in in gas stations. I mean, we've got a long ways to go with it, especially in more rural areas. But I think, you know, in bigger cities, you're seeing more uh, companies adapt to that. They know their customers looking for it. Oh, okay. So more people are becoming aware. Uh, yes, I think so. And more, I think more companies, more retailers are providing healthier options. Well, I know, you know, some of the big ones, we'll just name one, we're not supporting sale of its products because this is a non-commercial show. But let's just think of one that popped into my head that didn't used to be necessarily saying that they're healthy at all, like Panera Bread. But now on their commercials on TV, you know, instead of focusing on all their bread, which they still have with sugar on top and everything like that, they're just showing, you know, like these soup and salad options. Mm. So, you know, from a marketing trend, they must be recognizing that people do want to eat healthier. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We have to be careful of the marketing too, like you're saying. <laughs> so <laughs> we have to be our own doctor everywhere we go. <laughs> That's true. That's a very powerful <laughs> statement and actually really true in that uh, your doctor cannot provide you with health. No. They can only act as an educator. For instance, if they are a naturopathic physician, if you're lucky enough to have a doctor who does understand true science and truly what supports health and wellness, other than just the use of pharmaceutical drugs, um, then they would know that, in fact, the best thing to do is every client should be given a list of what foods, herbs, homeopathics, exercises, stress reduction techniques. They should actually have handouts like we do in natural medicine with that as the first line of intervention. And then, of course, when there's something serious like what you had, you do, you know, at least I will say, in my opinion, you do need the more aggressive therapies because um, I have found it very sad that when people choose only natural, it might not be effective enough for something really severe, like, you know, such as cancer. But things like yeah. digestive difficulties, skin rashes, all that, they don't need pharmaceuticals. They need food and lifestyle change. Exactly. And that's, you're absolutely right. I'm glad you bring that up just be, because we both do work and live on a, the holistic side. I, I believe there's a time and place for traditional medicine. and You mean conventional medicine? Yeah, sorry, conventional medicine. Right. <laughs> I'm a stickler uh, on that term. Yeah. All my guests, all my guests, everyone I tell, because traditional, traditional medicine is ancient. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's food and herbs, particularly botanicals, right. herbs. Those are traditional medications. And conventional, we can call it a lot of things. Conventional, we can call it allopathic, we can call it mainstream, we can call it modern, but not traditional because those pharmaceuticals have not been used for thousands of years with a great degree of safety and efficacy as botanicals have been. Mm, so that's why I'm a point. big stickler about that. So then when you write your next book and continue being a spokesperson in the natural industry, you know, you just like pass that along. So tell us about your book. It's called Claim Your Healing. Yeah, I had a lot of people coming to me, people I didn't know, um, asking me how I overcame stage four cancer with three months to live. And, you know, I felt like I had to keep telling the same story in, to, the, to each person. And I thought, okay, let me just write this book and put it out and I can give it out. And I give, you know, mainly just give it out. It's not a super expensive book. And it's just my story, my journey through two times of cancer, what I did to overcome that. And kind of the seven steps I took, I kind of broke that down in the book to claim your healing. And it's, you know, anywhere from the power of the mind, the power of our words, you know, of course, like we're talking about the power of choosing healthy choices for food, um, food as medicine, as we're talking about. And um, yeah, just each of those steps. And I've got a list of affirmations, things that I spoke over my body to bring it to life, to bring it into alignment of healing um, just the power of all of that, you know, and claim your healing. It's about staking a claim against the battle, you know, and, and, and bringing it, uh, to fruition. So it's a, it's a very small book, uh, but it's a very powerful book, I believe. 
So tell us, you know, you gave us a breakdown of the chapters, but it sounds like there's, you know, a lot of information in there that you can definitely share more yeah, specifically. Absolutely. Like, yeah. you know, what are the seven special things? Yeah. So one of them I really believe a lot is the power of our mind. I think in every area of our life, we have to take control of the thoughts that we think. And, you know, a lot of times the best way to do that is, you know, we change a thought by speaking something out loud, you know? Uh, and for me, I had to protect myself on that journey. I didn't talk to people about cancer, what I was going through with cancer, uh, unless I knew that they would be speaking positively about it, believing with me, praying. Um, some of my family members didn't really even know <laughs> because I wanted to protect that part. I needed to protect my mind. And I never questioned if I would be healed. I knew I would be healed. It was just a matter of when. I didn't know how uh, it would happen, but I just believed. I never believed I would die. And I think there's so much power in our mind. And I once read a quote that said that we only really use about 2% of our mind, that we really don't know how powerful we are. And I agree with that. I think if we really took the control of our thoughts and our mind, we would be so powerful to do anything fearlessly. And how does one go about doing that? Like, don't you have to take a step back and see what kind of thoughts and internal words you're already formulating to know how to change it? Absolutely. You have to be very uh, aware of what you're thinking. And that's intentional. It's just, you know, you really have to slow down. And you know, even meditation is a great tool uh, for that to just rest in, in your thought life and be able to take that step back, as you're saying, to be uh, in control of that and to calm it and just retrain it, you know, to give your brain other things to think. <laughs> so Right. And, and there's very specific tools that I have taught people how to use as well, such as wearing a rubber band around your wrist. Doesn't have to be that tight. And then every time you hear yourself, if you listen to what's going on in what we call the monkey mind, that internal thought process, and if you hear yourself worrying about everything, worrying about your bills, worrying about you're too fat, worrying about this, worrying <laughs> about that, you actually have a preformed, more positive statement to use as a replacement. And then when you catch yourself doing it, you do something like snap the rubber band, which is a reinforcement to your whole system. And then you change the tape for those of us old enough to remember videotapes. You change the tape to one of those preformed, really positive stories. Mm -hmm. And that's a very Love specific that. technique that, that we've often used because to say to do it is one thing. But to actually find a pattern or a path to really make change is another thing. Absolutely. Yeah, it's challenging to be disciplined. It's challenging to be disciplined. And also, let's say you catch yourself having one of those negative thoughts. It's really good to be prepared with a prefabbed positive thought that you can use to replace it. It really makes it an easier, you know, quicker and more automatic process. So tell us about what you learned from the French culture where you find that overall, even as a mainstream French culture, might be healthier than what goes on in the United States. Oh, my gosh. How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Um, it honestly has changed my life. I could cry just talking about it because um, I was actually filming a television show in Provence. This was three, four years ago. And it was really my first moment in you know, the south of France. I'd been to Paris, which is very much like the US in a lot of ways with the busyness. But um, in this moment, I, when we arrived to this beautiful chateau, which how can you go, you know, not enjoy a moment at a chateau, but we, I'd, I'd sat around the table with some of the French uh, pe local people there for lunch. And we sat for over three hours enjoying local fresh foods from local farmers, um, you know, fresh goat cheese, ba just uh, fresh baguettes and baked bread. And of course, rosé under the summer sun. And I, we sat for so long, I thought, are we ever going to get back to filming? You know, are we going to really work today? And there was no rush. It was like, nobody really cared to be in a rush. You know, we would get to it when we got to it. 
And I remember about three hours into the meal, I sat back in my chair, rosé in hand, and I looked up at the sky and I thought, what am I doing with my life? And I had never sat around the table for that long, enjoying a moment of just conversation and barely any of us could all speak the same language, you know, and we still had such a beautiful moment. And it was a moment of sharing, a moment of building relationships around good food. Um, And it changed my life. It was a simple moment like that, that I'd realized my life was out of balance in the US. I was chasing after the American dream and I was burning out. Thank you, Krista. That was a beautiful example. And with that, we're going to end our show today and tell our listeners that they can find you on Instagram and Facebook at Krista, that's K-R-I-S-T-A, Anderson dot co and we will have a live link to that on our archives after today's show so thank you so much for being our guest thank you for having me ellen appreciate it thank you listeners for tuning in once again to herbal yours produced in the studios or somewhere nearby of 90.3 whpc nassau community college garden city new york and you can also find us on itunes for further information email whpc at ncc.edu this is your host ellen kamai at naturalnurse.com inviting you to join us again next week for another edition of Herbally Yours. Until then, stay healthy.